The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Uh, downtown, uh, you know, has never been better. Uh, a year ago, people were, again, talking about how it wouldn't recover and it wouldn't come back. And uh, that, that, you know, all of us who, who know the strength of our, uh, of our downtown community knew that was impossible. So it's appropriate that we have uh, Judith Rogan here this morning to talk about resiliency. New York is about resiliency, and I want to thank uh, our host this morning, uh, the New York Academy of Science, for allowing us to be here. They too had vision. Post 9 11, they took this space uh, when nobody was renting down in lower Manhattan. So, to Alice Rubenstein and the whole team of the Academy, thank you for, for hosting us. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Judith Roden, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, Dr. Roden uh, leads the Rockefeller Foundation, one of the world's leading philanthropic organizations. She was previously president of the University of Pennsylvania and the provost of Yale University. Since joining the foundation in 2005, Dr. Roden has recalibrated its focus to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Dr. Roden has actively participated in influential global forums, including the World Economic Forum, the Council on Foreign Relations, Clinton Global Initiative, and the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, I had the honor of being on a panel with Judith uh, a few weeks ago with Cranes talking about resiliency, and it was very interesting to hear her, uh, her views. In November of 2012, Governor Andrew Cuomo named Dr. Rodin to co-chair the N New York State 2100 uh, Commission on Long-Term Resiliency following Superstorm Sandy. A pioneer and innovator throughout her career, Dr. Roden was the first woman to lead an Ivy League institution and its first woman to serve as the Rockefeller Foundation president in nearly 100 year history. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Judith, Dr. Judith Roden, who will talk about <laughs> resiliency. Great. Good morning, everyone, and thanks, Bill, for that great introduction. And importantly, for your steadfast civic leadership, I think you push all of us to do more of ourselves and, and for this great city. Um, I'd like to thank Abney for hosting this breakfast on resilience. As Bill said, it couldn't be more relevant. The images of uh, what's happening in the Philippines are still so fresh for all of us, and they reanimate for us the feelings that we had around Superstorm Sandy. Now, I don't want to be all doom and gloom before you've had your second cup of coffee. I think that's what the rest of the workday is for. Um, but I do want to uh, put the proper framing around why the issue of resilience is so important. For starters, maybe it's one of the few things that our outgoing and incoming mayors can agree on, um, besides maybe the Red Sox, which, by the way, I need some help in understanding. Now, I grew up in Philadelphia, and it seems to me that electing a Red Sox mayor is kind of akin to us electing Tony Romo as the mayor of Philadelphia. Uh, but, of course, that would never happen because we all know that the Cowboys can't close. Uh, <laughs> But besides the Red Sox, the other point of agreement between Mayor Bloomberg and Mayor-elect de Blasio is that we actually do have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to build a more resilient New York. Mayor Bloomberg's leadership has prepared us so well for this moment, and Chris's leadership of council has been so incredible as we rebuilt the city after 9-11, the visionary Plan YC to address climate change, but Truly, building resilience isn't a sprint. It's not even a marathon. It's actually a relay race. And now Bill de Blasio is taking up the baton. He won't be doing it alone. There are many institutions and organizations already standing by him and ready to run alongside him. But perhaps the most promising partnership, perhaps the most important partnership, is with the private sector, so many of you here in this room. Because whether you're considering floodgates for your buildings or determining where best to locate your generators, ensuring that your hardware and your data centers can stay online during a threat, or conducting emergency preparedness planning, that actually is building resilience. Now, you may just call it good business, 
but there's a great deal that the new administration can learn from your experience, your success, and the things that haven't gone so well. It's a two-way partnership. I know business and building owners are looking for direction from the city as well. As Bill said, he and I were recently on a panel talking about this subject. And Bill, I was so compelled by your story of having to rethink your entire business plan when Sandy-related flooding destroyed, destroyed your building systems not far from here. And so many of you in this room have faced similar tough decisions. Resilience thinking ensures that those choices don't pit the private sector against the public good or vice versa. Resilience requires us to find commonalities. How do we work together to protect one another? And so today, I want to make five recommendations for our incoming mayor that I believe will help tighten that partnership and create those linkages and make New York City more resilient. Now, as you know, I'm not in politics, nor am I in business. I'm the president of a 100-year-old philanthropy whose mission is to promote well-being around the world. So you might be wondering, what do I know, and maybe why do I care? Um, let me answer the first question briefly through the lens of Rockefeller Foundation's work, give you a little street cred in, in what we've been doing here. For the last decade, we've committed uh, or invested more than $100 million in building resilience worldwide. We've worked in New Orleans post-Katrina. We're working in dozens of Asian cities in six countries to help them build resilience to the impacts of climate change. In New York, we've been working with the city and a cadre of other partners on issues such as preparing the city for rising sea levels and how we protect our fragile ecosystems and our coastlines. Um, you've heard that I co-chaired the commission, one of the commissions on recovery from Sandy. Um, and this was the commission that focused explicitly on rebuilding and making New York's land use, insurance, energy, and transportation infrastructures more resilient. Earlier this year, uh, for our centennial, Rockefeller announced our 100 Resilient Cities Challenge, which will be supporting 100 cities around the globe in their efforts to build urban resilience. We'll be announcing the first group of winners next week. New York has applied, um, but I can't give you any advance information. To the second question, why would a philanthropy concern itself with the linkages between the public and the private sector? Actually, I'll maintain that this is what philanthropy actually does so well. Plays the role of catalyst, provides the risk capital, does the early pilot demonstrations of game-changing innovations, and then shares our learning and our dollars to leverage additional commitments and action from both the public sector and the private sectors. And so we have more than a few ideas on what the mayor should do regarding this issue. But let me start with the definition of resilience. Building resilience is about helping people and communities and institutions prepare for, withstand, and emerge stronger from both acute shocks but also chronic stresses. Though many people use the term synonymously, it's not the same as resolve, that is, the persistence to keep going in tough times, although New Yorkers, of course, have that in spades. Unlike resolve, resilience isn't an innate characteristic. It's kind of a muscle to exercise, a skill to learn. It's about developing a capacity to fail more safely and to rebound more quickly and effectively. Resilient systems share common characteristics, build in redundancy, alternatives when one part of the system fails, feedback loops, and options for quick sensing and learning. These characteristics are often the difference between a city that can emerge stronger from a storm like Sandy and a city that never fully recovers, and we've seen this all around the world. There's no question that the new administration will take office at a time when disruption and disasters are only growing in frequency, intensity, and unpredictability. Thousands more New Yorkers will be living in flood, flood zones, which have now been adjusted in the face of our challenging climate. Hotter days, and more of them, are expected each summer. Once-in-a-lifetime storms seem to threaten the coastline somewhere every year. And when the next catastrophic event hits, and it is when and not if, 
it almost certainly won't be another Sandy. Indeed, it's not high winds or flooding, or even what A-Rod's been up to lately, that is the greatest threat to New Yorkers. Studies show our biggest risk may actually be heat. But whatever it is, whether it's wind or sleet, enemies, foreign or domestic, we need to be prepared. Because while these shocks are not always preventable, the degree of devastation and destruction actually can be. And so I would also add that there's a clear impetus from a budgetary standpoint. With the $2 billion gap facing our next mayor, we have got to find ways to spend our money more cost effectively rather than using it to rebuild after every shock. And we have no time to waste. So here are five resilience priorities that the new mayor should put into action in his first 100 days. First, create the position of deputy mayor for economic development and resilience. In the aftermath of 9-11, Mayor Bloomberg designated Dan Doctoroff as the deputy mayor for economic development and rebuilding. This newly accomplished position accomplished two things. This newly created position accomplished two things. First, it put a single person in charge of coordinating the functions of government that ensured that at the time we rebuilt smarter and more effectively after the attacks. This was a huge paradigm shift. Second, it made explicit the link between physical infrastructure and the economy, without which we would not have had the incredible economic engines that have contributed to New York's growth over the last decade. The same connection has got to be met as we move from a rebuild mindset to one of resilient design. And the linkages between economic development and resilience is just as critical. A deputy mayor for economic development and resilience would play two important roles. First, he or she would coordinate the internal functions and agencies of government required to build and strengthen the physical resilience of the city, from NYCHA and land use to energy and transportation, from sustainability to parks. And second, the deputy mayor would ensure that all of our economic development decisions are building a more resilient economy that, like our infrastructure, can weather any shock. The closing of Wall Street in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy, as we know, was the first two-day shutdown since the great blizzard of 1888. In a city where one-third of the economy is based on finance and real estate, these kinds of disruptions can be catastrophic. We need economic systems that are redundant and flexible, both within sectors and across sectors. That means we're attracting new investment to diversify our economy and create new kinds of jobs for a new kind of future, building the backbone of the type of economy that in turn will enable people to bounce back more quickly after a disaster. The private sector can take on some of the risk to minimize economic disruption. For example, the insurance industry could create municipal sovereign insurance instruments that would go a long way to pre-fund disaster recovery and protect the city from large losses. And the city can focus on public sector mitigation activities, such as those that could reduce homeowners' rates and make communities more resilient, particularly advocating with FEMA to allow credits and rate decreases for resilience measures other than elevating property, which is just not always possible in New York City. Only a deputy mayor can have the view of the entire field that this will require and have the ear of the mayor to get it done. The city's chief resilience officer, which by the way is a position we'll be supporting globally through our 100 Resilient Cities Challenge, should report directly to that deputy mayor. This is our first idea, and it's something that Mayor-elect de Blasio could do on day one. Two, develop gold standard bus rapid transit in every borough. In the aftermath of Sandy, when the subway tunnels were flooded, Brooklynites boarded buses at Atlantic Terminal and crossed the East River bridges using exclusive lanes. They probably didn't know it at the time, but they were using a dressed-down version of a bus rapid transit system, BRT. 
BRT differs from regular bus service because it runs on dedicated lanes. It has priority signaling and off-board ticket purchasing, just to name a few of the distinct features that contribute to its high performance. Again, we have seen this in operation around the world. It's a model that can be implemented across the city permanently. BRT has two main benefits, in addition to, or in some cases as an alternative, to the city's subway system. First, BRT expands the city's transportation options at a much lower cost than, say, just think Second Avenue subway, which has taken billions of dollars, and BRT doesn't take 80 years to build. Second, BRT isn't just valuable for its flexibility in moving people around in emergencies. It's also about diversifying access, ensuring that those of our fellow citizens who have fewer transit options can get to their jobs and get to their schools, no matter where they live in the city, on storm day and every day. The next mayor, through his support and his MTA appointees, should push for gold standard BRT in all five boroughs. This type of implementation is already underway by Mayor Emanuel in Chicago. Three, the next mayor must double down on investments so that New York City remains a world leader on cutting edge resilience ideas and new technology. We have already had a head start on the rest of the world. Even before Sandy, a coalition of partners, including the Rockefeller Foundation, were working on design thinking and the science behind resilient cities. We've got some incredible resources for this learning right in our own backyard. For environmental and storm-related threats, these include the ecosystems and ecology of Jamaica Bay combined with top-notch research institutions and a rich network of architecture and engineering experts throughout the region. These will yield many new innovative technologies and products for which there is already a, a deep demand and a global market. And for man-made threats and shocks, our assets, of course, include many of you, those businesses who have been investing in approaches to building resilience in some shape or form since 9-11 shook us to the bone. We also have another exciting opportunity, and that's the rocketing growth of New York City's technology corridor, which is becoming New York's number two economic sector. The first graduate class at Cornell's tech campus is really a great signal for a bright future. But continuing investment in and coordination of all of this activity will be absolutely critical going forward. Four, get the money out of Washington and into the hands of citizens and resilience projects faster. I remember going to Breezy and Red Hook and the Rockaways after the storm and literally seeing people digging through rubble searching for their most precious possessions. As I noted, we're not going to always be able to prevent bad things from happening, but resilience approaches ensure that people will bounce back and be beyond their feet more quickly. We see the need for this kind of reframed and refreshed approach with billions of dollars still stuck in a maze of agencies and outdated policies. To take just one example, think of the homeowners in Breezy Point, many of whom face tremendous obstacles to securing building permits because their houses weren't on city maps. Turns out those maps were from 1948. And it's not just about the people, although of course they remain the top priority. There are now a number of studies and design challenges underway that will need sustained funding and will need additional commitments to turn the findings and ideas into reality. The US Army Corps of Engineers is currently assessing flood risks in vulnerable coastal populations between Southern Virginia and Rhode Island to ensure that we really understand what the pressures are from the mid-Atlantic uh, up to New England. But once that feasibility study is completed, the next mayor has got to put pressure on them to ensure that a more resilient infrastructure for New York City is built more quickly and more effectively. They have the money. And a number of compelling design opportunities are being generated by the Rebuild by Design competition, which Rockefeller helped to fund and is being led by HUD and the visionary secretary, Sean Donovan. 
This competition brought together high caliber teams from all around the world and from the fields of planning and design, from engineering and science to find better ways of implementing resilient design. For example, one design opportunity in Hunts Point would develop site-specific integrated storm protection and green infrastructure in conjunction with the industrial property owners with a focus on developing components that could be manufactured locally. This represents a great integration of resilient infrastructure and economic resilience by adding a variety of flood defenses to a waterfront area of the Bronx that is home to one of the largest food distribution centers in the world and could become an even greater engine of job creation. The mayor should work with HUD to implement those ideas, and he should use the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Funds to attract additional private sector partners for these commitments. These design projects can be built. They must be built. This will require organization. It will require coordination between federal, state, and city governments. Fortunately, Mayor de Blasio is a great organizer. We know this. Now it's time for him to put those talents to work as the chief executive of the city and build a coalition of business, labor, community groups, and others to keep the pressure on Washington and their agencies. We can get this bill and we can get it done. And five, Mayor-elect de Blasio should make investments in resilient infrastructure more attractive to private finance by creating an infrastructure bank. While there could be sufficient financing available today to meet the city's infrastructure needs, those investments aren't being made. The mayor can make those projects more attractive to private investment through strategic prioritization and integrated design of projects. For example, already in the United States, several western states have organized into a regional infrastructure exchange which seeks private investment in shared resilience building public works projects, new water systems, transportation, smart electric grids. To help package these kinds of investments, Mayor de Blasio should create a dedicated infrastructure bank to help coordinate resilient infrastructure development and investment across the city, introduce a centralized approach to infrastructure-related decision-making rather than a project-by-project, agency-by-agency process. This is an idea that my co-chair on NYS 2100, Felix Rowiton, truly the godfather of municipal finance, has been advocating for years, long before Sandy. It's something that Mayor Rahm Emanuel has done in Chicago with help from the Rockefeller Foundation, and his first sets of projects are getting underway this fall. I could sense a city rivalry moving away from pizza to a focus on infrastructure. We've just taken back the tallest building title. Why not a better infrastructure bank to finance architectural wonders that also protect our city? Let me conclude by reiterating that for Mayor de Blasio, the spirit of public-private partnership is going to be truly vital. The uh, incoming mayor might feel some pushback from those close to him. I know I have at times. But there's a common saying that disasters are great equalizers. And while it's true that disasters like Superstorm Sandy or heat waves or financial collapse impact people of every race and creed and class, they actually don't impact everyone equally. This is something that Mayor de Blasio, with his agenda on a fairer, more equitable city, can certainly get behind. Because whether you believe there are two New Yorks or five New Yorks, resilience actually is a bridge that can unite them all. And when it comes to facing the messy, complicated dynamics of the 21st century, we really are all in this together. Thank you. We thank you, Dr. Roden, very, very much. And one of the great Abney uh, speeches I've, I've heard. So.